she just adored the Israeli. But in November of that same year, the liberals dumped the Tory party in an election, a by-election, and Gladstone did come in. Now, William Ewart Gladstone was just the opposite as far as the Queen was concerned. First of all, he was a competitor for Disraeli, whom she loved, so that killed him right there. But he was from Liverpool, which was not a very fashionable area. He was a man whose family had money. They were landed gentry. He was well-educated, certainly. They were uh, non-conforming religionists, somewhat puritanical. And he was a lay preacher, Gladstone was. His uh, confreres in the house thought of him as a moralizing didact. He was a little bit pompous and a little bit, you know, everything was filled with biblical quotations and, and this was annoying to a very secular society. So, but he was very good and he had something of a social progressive attitude about him. He was called the People's William. Now we might not think of him as very progressive today, but in the age we're talking about, he was. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Gladstone, when he wasn't doing his work in the House, and certainly when he, wasn't, when he was Prime Minister, he spent his evenings tramping through places like Soho and Bow Bells, seeking out fallen women, whom he would induce to have them take him back to their cribs. They all had a crib, you know, every prostitute had some place. And there, he would get them to get down on their knees with him and pray for their soul's salvation. <laughs> and it's true, that's what he did. There's never an inkling that anything else transpired. But in his doing this, of course, he became the butt of many jokes on the part of his enemies when, when they heard about it, of course. It didn't matter to him. He was totally sincere. He was going to save these women from sin and damnation if he could. Well, it takes everybody. Uh, the problem the Queen had with him, other than the fact that he was a competitor for her Disraeli, <laughs> Uh, Gladstone was awkward with her. He was uncomfortable, and she didn't help. When, when he came to kiss hands, she didn't ask him to sit down and shake his hand. She addressed as few words as possible, and then he left. But on the occasions when he had to speak with her, he would talk to her over her head in a loud voice as if she were a public body. And this was terribly aggravating. She just was, everything about him aggravated the daylights out of her. So she simply detested him. And that's the way it went on for years.